Amen. We're glad you're here tonight. There comes the sound. I want to send love and prayers to all of you tonight in our Lord, and we're glad to see everybody tonight. And I have a very special person that I want to greet tonight in the Lord is my beautiful wife, Diane, who is a little under the weather. And so, hello, beloved. And everybody's waving to, to see everybody's waving to my Diane. They're all, see, they're all loving on you and waving to you. So anyway, thank you all for coming. And again, um, just a reminder again tonight, we have two handouts tonight that will hopefully be posted eventually later on tonight. You can hopefully get those two handouts. And, um, you know, I was just thinking about, you know, I've been a pastor for 40 years and, I, and I'm seeing it all happen right now. And I'm just hoping and praying that I can, can help as many people um, to see what's going on and to see the love of the Lord and to see a plan in their life and his purposes. And that, that's my only reason being a pastor. I'm not doing this for my health. I mean, I'm doing this because the Lord really wants everybody to know. That's part of the calling I think that every Christian has. We want people to know. You know, if you look at why our culture is, is so messed up, the answer is simple. What? They don't know. They have no idea what's actually happening. Can you imagine a person like me sitting down and having a power lunch with Gretchen Whitmer and just sitting around and say, Madam Governor, I just thought I'd share a little bit about the rapture. Could you pass the, you know, the coffee? I mean, I don't know. But you have to realize that we are in a time that the Bible said was going to be like this, that people were not paying a lot of attention. Isn't it amazing, church, that if you think about our Lord's first coming, we have to realize we can't expect a lot different before the rapture. Our Lord was ignored, betrayed, left behind, and a lot of things happened to him. You know, most people would, would say, um, wow, if Jesus was here doing the miracles that he did there, why, the whole city of Grand Rapids would be followed? Really? Is that really what happened? No, the reality is our Lord was rejected by many people. One of the things that we do in Israel is we take people up to one of the uh, sites in Bethsaida and we open up and read out of Matthew chapter 11 and our Lord talks about the cities of Bethsaida, Chorazin, and uh, Capernaum. Those were the three cities where our Lord had most of his ministry. And a lot of the people rejected him. Now, that's a hard thing to believe. How are you going to reject the Lord? I mean, he's doing miracles. He's doing amazing things. He's doing amazing things. Why would anybody not at least look into it or reject him? And yet our Lord gives a, a scathing rebuke. And he said, if the miracles done in you were done in Sodom and Gomorrah, those cities would still be around. And that always shocks me going up there because I think, wow, you got to have the Lord walking around and this was the reaction that you had. Now, take a look at what's happening prophetically. Church, we can't get a whole lot closer to the coming of the Lord than what happened in this past week in Iran and Israel. I didn't get a lot closer than what's underway now. Now, I would think tonight everybody would, you know, there'd be, we'd have to have traffic police down the road, you know, and stuff like that. But I don't think it's going to be a lot different. The very week it happens, the very week the rapture happens, it's going to be a small group. I don't like to talk that way because it sounds a little gloomy, but I, you tell me, what do you think is going to happen to this city when the Lord comes? It's going to be a remnant. I think it's a biblical answer. Well, listen, let's have a prayer, and beautiful Michelle is here for Glenn tonight, and she's going to play a song, but let me have a prayer, and then we'll get to Michelle, and then I'll do a rabbit trail about the rapture, and there's a whole bunch of stuff we're going to do tonight, and it'll be a very exciting evening, you know? I, was, I don't think this is stuff that we're doing is boring. I really don't. It's not like, you know, you come here on Thursday night, Hello, everybody. We're so glad you're here in class. Let's open the Bible and read God's Word. You know, I mean, I think we're, we're talking some pretty heavy-duty stuff, right? If this doesn't get a hold of Christians, I, I have nothing else in my tackle box. This is it, baby. It's the Bible. Let's have a word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you. And Father, I thank you for these amazing people here tonight and online. I thank you, Lord, that you got our attention. And I think, Lord, as we look at our city, we look at our country, we realize, Lord, that not many people are paying attention. Uh, this last week in Israel was beyond stupendous. And yet, Lord, I don't know who's awake. I really don't sometimes. So we would pray that you would use us tonight in this class to help people wake up, to see the greatness of your love and your purposes, Lord. You are just such a wonderful Lord. And we pray, Lord, that the things we share will not just be information, but will be life-changing, that we can take this information and these truths and share them with others, our families, people in our churches, people in our neighbors, 
that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon. And I would pray, Lord, that we could be used in these final months, a couple years, whatever's coming up, to just be a very fruitful group of Christians that will make a difference before you come. So we give you the class tonight. Thank you for it. And we pray all these things now in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Now, here's a song, and I talked to Michelle about this, and we thought we would have a good rapture song. Now, this actually is a rapture song, and yet nobody even talks about the rapture. The interesting thing, this song is in hymnals, and nobody knows it's talking about the rapture. They, they know that it's something about the Lord's return, but they're not sure. And I don't, yeah, so we, church is all arguing about all this stuff, so this is a good song. So here's the song, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. Now, where is the yonder? The yonder is up there, right? And not down here in Grand Rapids. So, that, saints, that is uh, 774. Uh, we're not, we don't, 774, and so beautiful Michelle is going to do that, and I don't know if I can do any leading here. Without Glenn, I can't sing, so I should get, what? How many verses do you Let's do, uh, we'll just do one and three. One and three? Yeah, one and three. This is a very nice song, and by the way, you know, the interesting thing, and here's how it's going to be different when the roll is called up yonder. Instead of me being here, the Lord will be standing there. That's how this will change. You won't see my smiling face. You see the Lord. So are you ready to roll? Hit it. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair When the work of all the earth shall gather over on the <coughs> When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the Michelle. Beautiful Michelle. Thank you, dear. Beautiful sister in the Lord. By the way, this lady is, she's, she's about as crazy as I am. We're pretty crazy together, but this lady actually gives out rapture kits. She actually goes out. And, yeah, amen. I mean, she, she has two left. She has two rapture kits, so if you need a rapture kit. All right, let me just touch on a couple of loose ends before we get into the study tonight. And again, there's two handouts that we're going to be using um, you know, saints, obviously we cannot get a whole lot closer to the coming of the Lord than what we just saw last week. I don't know how anybody cannot begin to realize we are in it here. And, of course, the wonderful thing is we've been talking about this for only about 20 years, right? I mean, the bottom line is we said, and I'll just touch bases on what we've talked about, we just said, hey, we're at this point on the line, follow that line up. Look for the war with Iran, and when that war with Iran takes off, then we're going to see the crossing thing will be the temple, and when the temple issues interact with the Iran war, and of course we have the Hamas, which of course is Iran, and of course the difference now is Iran is attacking directly, um, we'll be with the Lord here. Does everybody understand? I mean, I don't want to make this like we're not clear about what's happening. When this final conflagration happens. We're, not, we're moving toward it now, but once we get there, at that moment, we'll be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I just want you to know, these are big things underway. This isn't just some kind of, oh, that's interesting, you know. No, I mean, the bottom line is, I was listening to a very well-known pastor in this country. He's, he doesn't travel in my circles, but he, he's um, 
he's a good man. I think he's a really good guy. And he, he has a theology called post-millennialism. And I'm going to write that up here. I don't know if any of you have heard that. But let me just, I'm just going to take a little rabbit trail for a minute here. You have basically, and many Christians, and i said so many times, let me just say it again. Eschatology, or the Lord's return, is not an area to fight over. I think it's an exciting area. It's an interesting area. It's an area that I think will help us grow in our faith. It is the blessed hope, as Paul says in Titus. But you have what is called post-millennialism. And this guy is a post-millennialist. And basically, post-millennialism means that, that after the church has brought in this glorious period of peace and harmony and almost a millennium of good things, right, that eventually the church will begin to gain ascendancy in its influence in culture, that as that begins to happen, eventually, after post, after what we do, then Christ will return. Jesus returns. Now, I don't know how anybody is looking at anything today and think the church is going to do anything. I don't know how anybody can look at our culture in America or anywhere and think that our churches are turning back hell. I don't see it. Maybe you do. And you think any moment now we're going to, all of a sudden it's all going to be spirit-filled people running things in Washington. I don't see that coming. I don't think that is in any way on the radar. But this is a very nice guy. I mean, he's, he doesn't believe in the rapture. He's a really good guy. I like him. I, we'd get along great. Okay, that's one position. And then we have, uh, this is not, I'd seen the body of Christ. Well, post-millennialism is, is not a big position. It's probably less than 10% uh, of the body of Christ. Then you have another huge group, which is called amillennialism. And the amillennialist group is a lot of the Reformed, Christian Reformed, uh, many Catholics, uh, Methodists, sometimes Lutherans, there's some of the Presbyterians. So there's a lot of people that are amillennialists, and they believe that ah is a prefix meaning there is no millennium, that the church is essentially ruling on the earth on behalf of Christ. So this idea that we have of this thousand-year reign this is figurative language used in the Bible, and it really doesn't apply to a literal thousand years. And so it's a spiritualization of the fact that the church is going to be influencing the world. And, it, it, and, and a lot of the amillennialism, frankly, um, a lot of this came from the Roman Catholic Church. And of course, as many of us know, until about the 16th century, that's the only church there was, right? You just had the Roman Catholic Church, and then all of us Protestant types, we got in there with Luther and Calvin and the rest of them, right? I'm guessing that our millennialism, boy, I think it's 50% maybe. Um, I'm just guessing on the percent of the body of Christ. And then there's the position the Bible teaches, which, of course, and I'm trying to be charitable, but I think these are overwhelmingly clear today. I don't know how anybody can see it any differently, but I respect people. If you're an amillennialist or a postmillennialist or something, great. I mean, we love everybody in the Lord. It's not a deal, but premillennialism is the position the Bible teaches. And how sure is your pastor of this? Or, you know, I am 100% sure of that. I mean, that isn't even, that isn't even a hard one. Because what, pre, what premillennialism says is that before Christ's reign, things are going to fall apart. And we're going to do such a bad job with things down here that the Lord's got to come back and fix it. And you take a scripture like Matthew 24, and, you know, unless those days were stopped, no one would be left alive. That is not a post-millennial verse. Because I think one of the lessons that God is teaching Israel tonight, we'll talk about this in a minute, God is teaching Israel, she can't do it. Now, it's starting now, and it's going to get worse as the, as the Antichrist will deceive Israel, but the point is that the message, really, of the Bible is we can't do anything without the Lord. So this idea that we're going to, you know, do push-ups or we're going to go out and you know, do some things and turn the culture around, I don't think the Bible has ever taught that. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't be salt and light, we can't do some good things, we can't influence our culture. Of course we can. But the idea that we're going to go ahead and turn this around, so the premillennialism, you know, is probably, I don't know, I'm just guessing 30 to 40 percent maybe. And I think hopefully it's growing, but you don't really know. So these are the three main positions. And then there's a lot of people, they call themselves, have you heard it's a joke, I'm a pan-millennialist. 
I think everything's going to pan out in the end. Have you heard that, right? I mean, it's kind of a running joke. It, it's, yeah, they, they, people, a lot of Christians don't even want to get into this fray. So they said, eh, I don't want to get into this. So I'm a pan-millennialist. And a pan-millennialist is, I think everything's going to pan out. So, I mean, that's kind of what a pan-millennialist is. It's been a joke because a lot of Christians don't want to talk about this or they think it's an extraneous controversy and why get people f not focusing on Christ alone? And so this is why a lot of pastors and Christians just don't want to even get into this fray. And, and maybe some people online, I mean, obviously, if you're here, you have some interest in this. My question has always been from the beginning when I was a pastor 40 years ago, my question is who wouldn't be interested in Christ's return? I mean, isn't that, isn't that like Christianity 101? Now, I could take you through a lot of passages where Jesus talks about looking for his return. There's just so many of these passages, right? But I always do it in terms of marriage. Every believer who has faith in Christ is betrothed, right? We all belong to the Lord. Our faith in him has united us in a covenant got, brought by the Holy Spirit, connecting us and uniting us to Christ, right? Christ, our Lord, is the bridegroom, right? So if we're betrothed, we know that betrothal leads to a wedding. Now, I have three beautiful daughters that are all married now and eight grandchildren, and I can tell you this, if my girls when they were dating the young men that they were eventually going to marry, if I asked them, you know, are you looking forward to your wedding day? Well, dad, actually, not really. I don't know, whatever, you know. You know what I would tell my girls? You're engaged to the wrong guy. If you're not looking forward to getting married and the future with your future husband, what are we doing here, right? And I think that makes sense. So what I see is a great problem in the church. Whatever your eschatology, whatever your views about the Lord's return, and they're all over the place. If we believe that we are Christians in a betrothal state, right, then we should be looking forward to the future because that is really where Christianity leads. Christianity leads, ultimately, what is the rapture? I just dealt with it here last week. I was talking about the clips. Once the eclipse is that the sun and the moon in the total eclipse, what do we know about the sun and the moon in the total eclipse? They are as one. The two shall become one. That's why the eclipse here a couple weeks ago is the two shall become one. And as we probably realize that in the end, the two shall become one starts in Genesis 2. It's the story of marriage. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. Now we see... Of course, we have the Gentiles and the Jews, we have the church, and we have Israel. So all these things are basically God saying that what I want is to be in a relationship with you. That's really what the Bible says. I just want to be in a relationship with you. And it's, I think, the most basic message of Scripture. You know, the marriage, the story of marriage starts in Genesis 2 and ends in Revelation 21. I mean, that's what God's interested in. You know, and, and the problem is right now, people are not getting this, that he wants people, his people, to think about the wedding. And unfortunately, it just doesn't seem to be out there um, because betrothal is what you might call the gospel. But you can't have a gospel that has no interest in a future with the person that makes the gospel possible. So, you know, we just have to realize, you know, and what's the cross, by the way? The cross is what? It's the bride price. Right? That's all what the cross is, it's the bride price. And there are many wonderful believers that never have heard that in their whole life. So the point is that whatever you believe is all fine, but I want you to think about it, and I want you to realize that I believe it's important to the Lord. I think he is honored if we're interested. I really believe that. Now, you know tonight, if all of a sudden I walked up to one of you... I walked up to Michelle and I asked her, hey, Michelle, I like the purple outfit and tell me about yourself and your family. And I was interested in all about Michelle. When persons show interest in you, we like it. The problem in the church is we're not interested enough in the Lord. We're not asking questions. We're not seeking his face. We're, we're not going in and say, wow, you, you mean the Lord's return is nearing? We're, we're not asking questions. We just believe. Well, what does that mean? You know, 
The devil believes something. I mean, the point is that we're in a relationship with the Son of God, who is the Savior of the world, and the bridegroom, right? He's our bridegroom. And those are things that we should have as important for all of us. So, you know, like last week, before all this is Iran stuff, and of course the reason it was so, well, incredibly important is because, you see, now it's moving to where we knew it would move. We know it's moving away from the proxies. It's directly into Iran. We'll talk about that a little bit. But, and remember, as we've talked so many times before, Iran is just Persia. And Iran is the home of Amalek. And, of course, it's the home of Haman. It's the home of Esther. There's just so much going on in that country about the Bible, not only what has happened, what, what is about to happen. And I think if the church had a little more of a sense of the times we're in. You know, I'd love, it's like Easter Sunday. You know, every, every church is funny. You know, you look at your Easter Sunday attendance, attendance is up. I would like to think that what happened in this past week, every church would be jammed. Every church would be jammed with people. Because what just happened with Israel and Iran is much more significant than 9-11. When 9-11 happened, attendance went up in churches. People go, whoa, what's happening? It was significant because actually 9-11 is a picture of what's coming to this country. But in the last 23 years, we seem to have fallen asleep and thought, well, yeah, that happened. It's, it's over. No, it isn't. What happened 23 years ago was the beginning of where we're heading to now. This was always going on from the beginning and it's something that pastors and Christians should have talked about because, you know, th this thing, saints with Hamas, is not exactly a new rodeo with the idea of the Muslims hating the Jews, right? And we go back to 2001, 9-11. I mean, this stuff was all underway then. All of the people that were involved had the same theology, largely, of the people of Hamas. What was the goal? Destroy little Satan and destroy big Satan. And what we don't realize now is what's coming to our country. We have this idea that we're going to be protected. We're going to get into that night. That is not right. But we have this idea that we're over here. Life is good. And whatever they're doing over there, it has nothing to do with us. Wow. The greatest insurance policy this country could have is to support Israel and stop the hell over there before it gets here. But I don't think that's the thinking of the current administration and many people today. So, all right, I wanted, to I wanted to share something with you. Turn with me to Matthew 24. This is a baby rabbit trail, but we'll get to it and have some fun with this. What is the goal of the Lord Jesus Christ and the goal of the Messiah? The goal of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Messiah in Matthew 24 is to gather the diaspora. Okay, now, we don't think about a diaspora here. I mean, I'm a Scandinavian background. My ancestors came from Norway, you know, um, from uh, Denmark, from Sweden. Okay, I'm a part of the Swedish diaspora. Maybe some of you have Swedish background. We don't think about that. Everybody is from a diaspora, right? In the greatest sense, we're from the one diaspora of Adam and Eve, right? I mean, Adam and Eve was a diaspora. Let me just put this up here real quick. I hope you have fun with this tonight. I think this is worth the trip doing this. So what's the one thing our Lord is going to do? He's going to gather his people and bring the redeemed back to Israel. Now, the interesting thing, of course, that's been going on now for the last 1948. But, you know, originally, of course, if we just look at it this, we realize there was a Israel, there's a diaspora. And the word diaspora is where we get our word disperse, right? We just kind of disperse the people of God. And so first part of the diaspora was essentially Adam and Eve. Okay? So Adam and Eve go out, they go to the east, and then eventually we end up here with the Tower of Babel. And what happened there? A dispersion, right? So everybody goes this way, they go that way, they go this way, they go that way. Everybody is being dispersed, Genesis chapter 11. But then, if you remember what happened, there was another dispersion, actually two of them, but the one I'll focus on was the diaspora of the Roman Empire with Israel. Because in 70 AD and in 132 AD, 
the Jews started leaving the Middle East. They were leaving Israel. They were leaving the whole area. And of course, as we said, the one thing that we all should understand is there is absolutely no such thing as a Palestinian people. It doesn't exist. So the great lie that's being foisted on the church and on the public today is there's this group of uh, Palestinians that just had their land stolen from them, and, and this is kind of where, where things are, right? I mean, this, this is what mo- a lot of people believe this, and especially our young people. I think they don't have a background in any of this, even what I'm talking about. And so in the end, and that was, of course, in 132, right? 135, 132, 135. That's where we get the word Palestinians, because the Romans hated the Jews and said, let's just call the land instead of Israel, we'll call it Palestine, and we'll be done with those pesky Jews who caused all this trouble for us. Now, that seemed to be the way that the thing was going, right? So then in 132, 70 AD, now the Jews, let's see if we can do this. So everybody gets sent all over the world, right? They go up to Europe. They come over to the U.S. of A. They get sent over, which we're going to look at a clip, to Australia. You know, you don't think of the Jews in Australia. Do you think of Jews in Australia? I don't, generally. But anyway, so we have over here the eventually up Australia. And so the history of essentially the world has been the distribution and diaspora of the Jewish people. So what is God doing right now? People don't realize that he's bringing them all together now. And he has been able, because of their culture, the Jewish laws, the rituals, the way they dress, he's been able to hold them together because they cannot be destroyed until Messiah returns. Because he, in the end, is the guarantor that they will survive. Now, two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, we did Am Yisrael Hai. Do you remember that? I don't know if you were here for that. Okay. Yeah, was it, yeah we, I had a shirt on, remember we were doing that? So what, what, the, what, what we were singing and talking about with my shirt is on the people or nation of Israel lives. And so the great song that the Jewish people sing is, you can't kill us. You can never get rid of Jews. You can never get rid of the nation of Israel. We're always going to be here. And this is something that Hamas and Iran and the rest of these people do not realize. They're fighting Almighty God. Now, this is a problem even in the church, you know, because there's uh, people I hear in this town, they just think, you know, the Jews have no part of anything. And it's just a lot of bad, I think, bad theology. But anyway, Am Israel High is the second most favorite song in the Jewish nation of Israel next to Hatikva. Hatikva is the national anthem. So Hatikva means the hope. Now, what I wanted to show you tonight for just a couple of minutes here, it's about three minutes, I want to show you what, it makes me emotional. I want, boy, I want you to see what God is doing on Australia. Now, Australia is hardly Israel, right? I mean, you know, we we know what Hamas is doing over there. But yet these kids are all a part of what's unfolding right now. And they actually belong to a little college called Mariah College. And there's just a sweet bunch of kids. I don't know what's, where the, all this is going, but Moriah College, of course, is Mount Moriah, is where our Lord died. So they're really honoring the Messiah. They don't really know, but they're all singing this song together, Am Yisrael Hai, and it's very emotional to watch it because I have the lyrics of the song, and I just wanted to, to give you part of it. You, I don't think you'll be able to read it, but you'll get a visual that I think will be powerful tonight. So anyway, Am Yisrael Hai, and one of the things is, It goes, um, God the Blessed One, He watches over us. So who can triumph over us? Because we have no other land to go. Now these children are going to be singing this. Now, you think that God Almighty is not on the move. Now what He's doing with them in Australia, He's doing all over the world. And when the Messiah comes, what is He going to do? He's going to gather them. There's going to be a huge world war coming up here. And a lot of stuff is going to happen, and he's going to gather them from every nation to fulfill the messianic promises of the Bible to regather and restore the remnant and the diaspora. So let's go to Matthew 24. And this is a verse that maybe you'll gain some insight into tonight that you might not have thought about. Matthew 24. This is one of these verses. You, I used to read this for years, and I go, what does that have to do with me? You know, you just don't you ever get a verse, you go, what does that have to do with me? 
you know, because we tend to always think about ourselves and what does that have to do with me? Make this relevant, Pastor. And I have to realize that this verse in Matthew 24 is connected to the second coming of our Lord. When our Lord comes, what is he going to do? He's going to gather his people, the remnant who believed in him from all the nations of the earth, and his kingdom will be established on the earth, and it will last for a thousand years. That is pre-millennialism, and I think it's an unquestionable doctrine, but again, if people disagree with me, you have a right to be wrong, right? A little joke. That was a little joke. I just... No, but here, here's the thing. I don't... A lot of this is not super important, but here's what. I want you to get motivated to study. I want people to think about this. If I can get under your skin, I don't try to be an edgy person. Ask my wife. I'm really a very kind, warm, lovable fuzzball. But if I can get you to do some thinking, if I can get you to do some thinking, and then you stir it, you study a little bit, go, yeah, I see it now, then I have achieved my goal as a teacher of the word. I mean, I, I, th I think that the mistake that's going on in our churches is the pastors are running around holy water. Be blessed. Be blessed. Have a great week. Enjoy your vacation. Celebrate your new promotion. Go out and remodel your kitchen. What's happening is the church is baptizing our culture. It needs to be baptizing believers and realize that the culture can be and often is very toxic to the church, right? Okay, here's a verse you, again, may not have thought much about. All right. All right, let's see what I want to go here. All right. Okay, verse 30 of Matthew 24. The setting of Matthew 24, 30 is the tribulation period and the period just before the Lord's return. This is the last three and a half years. You can actually see it in verse 29. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Why? Because we're gone. There it is. The Lord and his people are not shining brightly. We're gone. You take the Christian church and, and people that know something about the things of the Lord, you take us out of this culture, how long do we last down here? They're trying to get rid of us now. Immediately after the stress of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all the nations will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now, here's the verse. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. This is Yom Kippur, by the way. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to another. In other words, God is going to go out all through the world and gather these children and people like that to fulfill his purposes in the diaspora. So when you hear these kids singing tonight, I just want you to think the plan that is underway tonight is beyond anything that we can even imagine. And boy, you know, if I started to realize the Lord was doing this kind of stuff, this would be a great time to surrender. You know, these people in Hamas, I, I feel a sadness for them. It's very tragic. You know, I was thinking about the Hamas commander. He's like a billionaire. He had... Um, he is worth a billion dollars. He's murdered and killed thousands. And the Israelis got his family here this past week. I mentioned this to a few of you. And they sent a drone in and killed three of his sons. Maybe you saw the story. And a bunch of his grandchildren. And, you know, I mean, I have grandchildren, my kids. I, I'd just be devastated if anything happened like that. He's like, oh, bless Allah. Yeah. You know, it's just, it, just something is wrong. No deep sense of respect and love for human life. It just... Unbelievable. If he feels that way about his kids and grandchildren, we wonder why he's acting this way toward the Israelis. It's unbelievable. I mean, I feel like if I met this guy, you know, I'd like to go up to him and say, hi, uh, do you have kids? Well, not anymore, but if you went up to anybody and said, can't we have a birthday party? Can't we have a little fun? You want some cake? You want to be a human being or a murderer? That's where we are. And that's what Israel is facing. So 
Again, as we get ready for our little clip here, I want you to watch this, and I want you to think about what we've just talked about tonight. We are going to see the hand of God moving in ways we've never imagined. Kevin, you got it? And we're going to cut the lights, I think, in the back, too. So it's about three minutes, and uh, they're singing the song, Am Israel High, and they're saying, God is watching over us because we have no other land in which we can go, and yet they're in Australia. What are they doing down there? Well, they're going home soon. So you want to make that a little bigger, Mr. Kevin, and crank that sound up a little bit, and let's have some fun with this. Turn the lights on, Kevin. That was interesting. But the interesting thing, their first language is English. Did you hear the Australian accent? The kids. Oh, yeah. yeah, we're good here. But their first, their first language is English, like us. But you can hear the Aussie accent. Now these kids are part of God's plan. God is working in in Australia, and He is doing things we can't even imagine. I thought, as I shared earlier, they're singing that the Lord's watching over us. And even though through hard times, and we're having terribly hard times, right, we shouldn't be discouraged. We have no other land to go to. 
Now, don't think the Lord isn't watching this and this thing is coming. Matthew 24 is about to happen. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes, when this all unfolds, these children and kids all over the world, whatever's underway, is far beyond anything that we can imagine. And so I say, you have to realize that how did God get all those people down there? You know the reason that God put the Jews all over the world? Was to protect them. When they were all in Europe, they had the Holocaust. Does everybody understand that part of the reason the Jews have been sent to this country, to various places, was to spread them and protect them? And now what are we starting to see happen in this country? We're seeing levels of anti-Semitism beginning in some of our universities and places that are going on. So, so my point is, I showed you that tonight to let you see what a big plan is underway here. And I get very emotional when I see that because they don't know our Lord right now, but they're going to. I think many of those kids will come to faith. It's just a spectacular thing that's underway now. And, and people like Hamas and all these crazies in the Middle East, they don't know about the kids. They don't know what God is up to, but he is here. He is bringing that diaspora back home. And when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, the earth will be filled with the glory of God. So just remember, all these things are on, and we have a privilege of getting to see this. Okay, let's get um, the sheet I wanted to pull out here. Would you pull out the act uh, of God? This is a sheet that I gave out tonight. If you pick that up, I hope you all got it. And I want you to turn with me to Psalm 20, if you can. So pull this sheet out if you hopefully have that, and then we'll look at Psalm 20. And the one thing that I would say tonight is, how about this? And it's not been anything different, but the ball is in the Lord's court. It's always been there, but I mean, we're starting to realize it now because, of course, as you're realizing Israel, of course, and what's underway is that that Psalm 83 group, you know, you've got Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Iraq, Iran, Syria. I mean, everybody is kind of coming in now right there. And look, it's starting to look a little dark. It's starting to look like, oh, you know, they could be in some trouble, right? No. If every one of the people in Israel went into the fetal position tonight, the Israeli Defense Force gave their weapons up, Israel would not be defeated. Now, we all have this idea, and the Israelis have this idea, you know, what's keeping Israel going? Uh, the IDF? No. The IDF is not, not doing that. The thing that is holding this thing together is God Almighty. See, he's watching those little kids in Australia. He knows what's going on. He is going to be their warrior, and he's going to do the things that he needs to do to fulfill the promises of Scripture and to honor his covenant with Israel. So we know that as this uh, you know, thing just happened here with Iran, many of you know the story that they launched about, oh, I don't know, 300 or more, whatever it was, right? First time it's ever happened in Israel's history. So that's why I tell you, the thing we're in with Hamas is going to take us right to the Lord's return. This is not something, yeah, 10 years from now, sure. No, 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 no. We're on the train now. This thing's going to take us right to the Lord. And you notice that just after Hamas does this unprecedented slaughter, and you notice how it's always first time things like the most number of Jews killed since the Holocaust in Israel. Do you notice how we're getting firsts now? That happened on October 7th. And now, the first time we've seen a barrage of missiles, rockets, and cruise missiles, whatever, launched to get Israel in the history of their country, and in many ways of many countries. Nobody has endured this sort of thing. And yet, as you follow the story, nobody except one girl was killed, and 99% of it was completely stopped. Now, the reason that, that whatever's happening is they have a nice military, and our, our military helped, I'm sure, and some others, the Saudis and Jordanians and maybe the Brits and stuff. It doesn't matter if they do anything. If all of a sudden... Our country decides, you know, hey, Israel, I want to be elected. I want to make the Muslims in Dearborn happy. If we decided to bail out of all of the things that are going on, just, you're on your own, you know, we'll pray for you. If, if all the nations left Israel alone, she cannot be defeated. 
And I think that's an important thing to remember. Nothing is going to stop what God is up to. So again, if they went into a fetal position, wouldn't matter. God would stop anyone trying to stop his purposes. Now, we have a hard time thinking that way, but the saints, that's what's coming. And we'll get into it tonight because, as you know, this Iranian army is going to be destroyed. The entire army is going to be vaporized. You know, every once in a while, you know, I watch these people, and I do have a deep sorrow for them. If you've ever seen some of the footage, you know, with, ah, you know, death to Israel and all these sorts of things. Maybe you've seen some of the news. You know, just about a lot of those people are going to be dead. And that's just this life. So it's a, a terrible time is coming for them. They don't, of course, see this. They only can see this rage to kill the Jews, to murder them. It's a demonic spirit. That's really what's driving them. There is no sense of, hey, let's sit down and talk. Can't we work some things through? That's not where anybody's coming from. So in this, in this uh, recent salvo from Iran, if the Lord had not given his hand on this, a couple thousand people could have been killed. And we had one Muslim girl, I guess is what I heard, so basically, how many casualties did the Israelis really have? Zero. At the greatest attack on the nation in its history. Just after Hamas murdered 1,200 and took 300 hostages, the greatest attack in history since the Holocaust. Do you see the demonic spirit is coming against them now very powerfully? And yet God is saying no. They cannot be moved. They cannot be taken out of the land until his purposes are fulfilled. And we have to have that understanding here tonight, which would be part of our, our class as we get in a little bit into the Ezekiel War. Anyway, this was an act. Somebody, a couple of you gave this to me, but I, I thought I would just pass this out. This uh, is an article by uh, apparently an Israeli physicist. I wanted to share something that is much more than a feeling, something that comes from a real calculation. What happened in Israel last Sabbath was not less than the scale of splitting the Yom Su, which is the Red Sea. So what this, this Israeli physicist, he's not Christian. He says that what just happened here, stopping all of these things from getting in there. Now, he, you know, apparently there was a use of the military and some things, sure. He said it's the same as parting the Red Sea. Now, I don't know if that's true. I mean, that's an interesting comment. But what he's saying is, now here's the thing. What he's saying is, is that Israel, is history, is all about one major event, the Exodus. Splitting of the Red Sea is the idea that Moses took the children of Israel through the Red Sea, right? We know that. And so tonight, what we're going to talk about, that was the first Exodus. This uh, Israeli science guy is talking about the first Exodus. And what he's telling us in Revelation 12, which we'll get to in a few minutes here, is we are very near, we may be literally months away from the second Exodus. Because the Bible is set up really around two main exoduses for Israel. If you were to define the Bible, here, let me erase this. The, the Bible is set up primarily around two exoduses for the nation of Israel. And, of course, we just happen to be in the middle of it, you know, through our Lord, and he brings an exodus to us through the cross. So we know that we're in the storyline, we're grafted in, we're a part of this, but the whole Bible can be divided into basically, you have an Exodus, right? Exodus chapter 12, we know the story, we know Moses, and we know the Red Sea is divided. And we see a great miracle, right? Now, if you remember the miracle, most of us know this, probably the 10 plagues, we know. How much did Moses and all of the people have to do with the miracles of the Exodus? How many of you think that the Israeli Defense Force is going to have anything to do with what's coming? They're not. God will move and do it himself. He doesn't need the IDF. He doesn't need America. He doesn't need the Brits. He doesn't need anybody. So we come over here, which we'll look at in a minute. We have Revelation 12, which we'll get to. And both of these, in the end, what is the Lord going to do? As we're going to see here in a minute, he's going to wipe out these armies the same way he took care of Pharaoh. Because remember, what happened to Pharaoh's army? They went into Yom Suf, they went into the Red Sea. What happened to them? Woo! Right? The waters came in on them. What did the Jewish people and the people of Israel do to create any of that? Of course, zero. 
What's going to happen if we look at Revelation 12 tonight? What is the Israeli people going to do to make this happen? Zero. Now, along the journey here, our wonderful Lord comes into the world. And so he is the true story of the Passover. And so the first Exodus story points to him. And the last Exodus story, which literally can be months away now. We are moving so fast now. You have to realize, uh, who. Anyway, so this one here is going back to look at that. All right, and so we have a Passover story here in Revelation 12, and of course the original Passover here. If I was to lay the Bible out for a young person or any of us, that's a good way to do it. Everything you're watching in Israel with Iran is this. Because the moment Israel's enemies are vaporized, she can go out into the wilderness. We'll see this in just a minute. So we know over here that eventually in Revelation 12, Israel goes into the wilderness for three and a half years. But notice the location. All right, come back over here. When Israel, when the armies of Pharaoh were wiped out, what happened to Israel? She went into the wilderness. How long? Three and a half years? No. Somebody? 40. Right, okay, everybody's got that. So around 40, 38, so we got 40. So what, what I'm trying to say is if you understand the Exodus story, you have the complete picture of what's about to happen. It really is a basic Bible study of the Exodus story with Israel. Now, of course, what do we do to get ourselves out of our sins? Can I give you an answer to that? Right. We can't get out of Egypt with our power. Israel can't defeat the crazies in the Middle East. We can't do enough to merit going to heaven. It's all his work. And this is the way to understand the history of the world. This is the whole thing right here. And so what we're going to look at a little bit tonight is that story. And I love the zero part. So let's take a look at, I think I asked you to turn to um, Psalm 20. Let's look at Psalm 20. Psalm 20. It's so exciting to see what God is doing. My goodness. Every generation waited for this. So we can't sit there and go, oh, well, yeah, yeah, I guess they did, you know. No, let's go, you know, right? <laughs> Think of your parents or your grandparents or your great-grandparents. They're in heaven, you know. They would trade places with you if they could. They would love to be where you are today. You mean I could trade places with my great-grandson or daughter and get to see what God was doing? Yeah, come on, Grandma. See, they don't have, see, we are at this chosen, special generation. All right, Psalm 20. And I think this is the essence of where we're heading right now because God is a zero God. He does everything and we receive the blessings. That is who our Lord is. That's what he did for Moses and the children of Israel. That's what's coming up right now, literally in months, a couple years, whatever. That, that's coming up, and then it's also what he did for us through the cross. Zero, zero, zero. Here's the verse in chapter 20, or Psalm 20. Let me get this here. <clears throat> All right. Take a look at verse 7. I think this is a... a a real good verse for the IDF tonight, and, and also um, all these psalms, I'll talk about this. Psalm, verse 7, Psalm 20, trust in chariots and some trust in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. See, that's why the IDF can't save them. The technology that was working this past week to keep the missiles out However, God orchestrated that they cannot do anything to that nation that he doesn't allow. Not one bullet will hit a child. Not one thing is going to happen unless the Lord allows it. Because let's take as an example, because Israel, as you probably have heard, they would love to launch a strike right now. I think some of them certainly want to do that. They want to launch a strike. Biden and many of the people say, no strike, don't do that, we're not going to support you. So you can begin to see the tension internationally that's growing about what do we do? 
the Jews want to attack, you know, Netanyahu, he wants to do this or that. So you can begin to see what's happening. Now, the Lord is in complete control of this whole drama right now. Now, you know that if that attack that happened from Iran the other night, if you had seven, 800 people killed, which could have happened easily, do you think you could hold the Jews back in Israel from doing something? Seven, 800 people killed in those attacks. So whatever's happening, the Lord's going, no, not no. Now, the Israelis may attack next week. They may do it in two weeks, whatever's happening. But I think we all realize that this is going to escalate and eventually move to another place. Does anybody here think tonight this can go on for another two, three years? How many think this is just going to be another couple years of this and who knows and it ain't going to happen? And then, of course, as all of this is happening, our country's in chaos. The one nation that should have some sense of stability, our, our nation is so deeply divided. You know, there's a, what's it, the movie they're having now coming out called Civil War? Some movie coming out about Civil War? Because what, what, what we're all seeing is, how do you get rid of a country? You divide it. And then it's conquered. And then a new power vacuum comes in, the Antichrist. It's all moving there very quickly now, you see. Now, if we were in happy land here and everything was great, then I wouldn't be talking this way. We're at the end here, church. We are at the end. And once this thing with Iran comes up here at another level, and we're just getting started on that, it's got some really ugly stuff coming. And as I've said in class tonight, I mean, I don't think we can rule out anything at this point including nuclear, anything. I don't think you can rule out a thing of what's going on. It could come from the Russians. It could come from who knows who. But we are in an amazing time. And the problem is people look at what's going on and they think this has nothing to do with the Bible. Well, it's just a mess everywhere. Well, but it's a mess that God knows and is controlling and talking about for his purposes here. Let's continue reading in Psalm 20. But we trust in the name of our Lord, the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. And that's exactly what the Lord is going to do. He's going to let Israel's enemies fall, and Israel will be standing there at the end on the place that God has created for them. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 12. This is one of my favorite passages. Zechariah chapter 12. Verse 7, Zechariah 12, 7. The Lord will save the dwellings of Judah first so that the honor of the house of David and the Jerusalem's inhabitants may not be greater than that of Judah. On that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them, the person in the fetal position, will be like David. And the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. Now, remember when the angel of the Lord showed up? The Exodus. Remember the Exodus story? In the Exodus story, remember, you had over here, you had the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord, by the way, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can see now that this passage is actually referring to the future and we'll get to that hopefully a little bit later. But my point is, the best way to understand the Bible is just look at the two Exodus stories, and then in the middle is you, is me. If you can just connect those, I think that's the best way to really see where we are right now. Okay. So that passage in Zechariah chapter 4, and of course you notice that right after Israel so weak and so feeble and so pitiful, what happens? Jesus returns and they look at him, the one they've pierced. Isn't that amazing? One of the great verses that's used in the New Testament is the next verse. Isn't that amazing that when Israel is at her weakest point, the Lord Jesus Christ returns in glory and sets his feet on the Mount of Olives. Let's take a look at that verse and then we'll go on to where I want some other things I want to do here. This is verse uh, 10, um, 10 on this time, right after that uh, on that day, verse 9, it says, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. That does not sound good. How many think that they need the patriot batteries to take care of the nations? 
Do you realize all the Lord has to do is just blink and this earth is gone? It's nice that the Lord doesn't act that way, but the point of it is, is his power to do things is beyond anything we can imagine. He's managing a hundred trillion suns. He's watching every nation. The idea that we, we don't realize that God is in charge, I mean, this is the problem, and I think that we all need to just get a bigger view of the Lord, starting with myself. Verse 10, and I will pour out in the house of David and the supplicants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, they will look on me, the one they've pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. This, of course, is quoted in John 19. So what happens when Israel is delivered from her enemies, when she's feeble and weak and in a fetal position? God goes in and takes over the world, and the Lord Jesus Christ is standing there, and they look on him, and they come to faith. And I believe some of those girls and young boys that we saw in Australia will be there. I believe that. I really do. So I think that's something that's just electrifying to me to see what's coming. Okay, let's go back to our act of God here. Let me read a little of this more for you. I am a professor of physics and work for several years in the defense industry in Israel on projects that are still at the cutting edge of technologies of the defense of the state of Israel. When I look at what happened on this Sabbath on a scientific level, it simply cannot happen statistically. And and I love this because he's not coming and this is like Pastor Jeff or he's, you know, he's just, wait a minute. What happened shouldn't happen. Even he is beginning. Now, remember, when the Lord sets up the second exodus, which I'm going to talk about tonight, the moment the nation sees that, they're going to come to faith. Because, you see, even the professor now, God's working on him. Not a Christian. But even he goes, whoa. There's something amazing here. Even I can't figure this out, right? And now when the nation sees these armies vaporized, it will be the beginning of the nation turning to faith. It will be a replay of the book of Exodus and the story of Pharaoh's army being wiped out. You know, and we're sitting around, you know, our leadership is so unaware of any of this discussion. I don't know how, I don't know what you do. You know, the problem is, you know, if you're in Washington and you just like, like to even to be a chaplain, you know, like in Washington, you know, if I went and just decided, like you probably saw that with Jack Hibbs, he did the prayer in front of Congress. That turned into like World War III. I mean, he just, just had a little prayer and next thing you know, ah, you hate her, you know. If you just go to Washington today and offer a prayer, you'll be attacked. I don't think that most, there's some great people in Washington, but not many, sadly. I don't think they're really teachable to what God is doing. Now, you remember that, you know, when this stuff really gets ugly, what's the Lord going to do? He's going to send in the two witnesses. And the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 1. By the way, I just thought I'd mention this tonight as a little afterthought. Tonight, this is the day of the Hebrew calendar, Nisan 10. So we're at Nisan 10 tonight. What is Nisan 10? It's the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. So this is Palm Sabbath. It's also the same day that the Antichrist will present himself as, the, as their Messiah. So we see that it is also connected to the Antichrist. And it is also the same day the two witnesses are murdered in Revelation 11. So the point is, every single event is lined up chronologically in Scripture to teach witnesses. The true Lord comes, he's rejected. False Messiah comes, sadly he's accepted. And then all heck breaks loose, and God has to stop it. And so he sends the two witnesses in here to wake people up. What do you think would happen to the two witnesses if they went to Washington today? I'll let you figure that out. I don't know what would happen, but listen, let's be honest. It's not happy land. Would you agree? All right, let's go back to the sheet here. So, and I I love this guy. He's so great. He says, this just can't happen. And then notice what he says. It was a miracle. The hand of Hashem, which is just the name. The likelihood that everything, but really everything, works out does not exist in complex systems like the defense systems that were used to defend Israel from the massive Iranian attack. These systems have never, but never, 
not only in the state of Israel, been tried in real time. So this is all because they never had an attack like this. So this thing's going on, and they never really had a chance to test all this out. It was there, but it got tested in a strange way, right? I took a pencil and dived into the calculations to check the pro statistic probability that such a result would materialize. The large number of events had to be handled each when each missile or UAV is handled independently, that is, human error or some deviation of one operation is not offset by other successful operations, compounds the chance of making a mistake. With all the high technologies, a breach was expected in the defense of the state skies of Israel. Even if we got 90% protection, it would have been a miracle. What happened is that everyone, but everyone, the pilots, the systems, the operators, the technological operators, acted as one person. Now you tell me what that means. That one person is God. That's what we're hearing here. We're watching this stuff. This is a guy who doesn't seem to have any clear sense of our Lord at this time, may soon, but he goes, acted as one man at one moment in total unity. If this is not an act of God, then I no longer know what a miracle is. And notice what he said, and this is interesting. It is a greater than the victory of the Six-Day War, which is 67, and the War of Independence. Those wars can be explained through natural events. But the rescue that took place for the people of Israel on that Sabbath is simply impossible naturally. This miracle saved the lives of thousands of people in Israel. Now again, if a bunch of people were killed... I don't think you can stop Israel right now. And whatever the Lord is doing, you might slow it down for a season. But in other words, there's a reason the timing has to be perfect. And right now, he's not ready to, to take this to another level. I don't know what the events are going to be. We're all watching it. You know, everybody should be watching this stuff, right? You know, I mean, if we're watching what's happening right now, of course, I watch this stuff all the time. I, I have so much fun at home. I know the word is fun. But I'm watching this stuff, and, and of course, I know where this is going. I'm going to meet my Lord. That's what you should be thinking about. We all should be thinking about it. We're down here, and this line is going up here. And so right now, we're here at 2024. Well, we know something else is coming. And we know something else after that is coming. And then we know after that something else is coming. And we, as God's people, should be interested in what's coming because we're going to get to a point where we're going to be looking at the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. Now, that to me is exciting for every believer. So if we're here tonight with what this physicist guy is saying, shouldn't the church or Christians be interested? Whoa, I don't know what God's going to do now. What's next? I just am not into shopping at Meyer right now. We had a whole lot of people. It's just day-to-day -day living. God is putting on a spectacular show of his power. We have to get drawn into this. That's, that's my feeling, at least. Let's continue reading here. If the defense system had failed to intercept a number of cruise missiles, the result would have dragged us into a very complex war. You see the timing here? God is not ready until he's ready. And when he's ready, he'll take care of the children in Australia. He'll take care of you. He'll take care of me. He's going to take care of the nations, but they're all going to fit into his purposes in Scripture. The simple proof of what I said is that managers of the defense industry who develop and manufacture these systems guarantee no more than 90% success. And we saw with our own eyes 99.9%. .9 and he goes, thank you, Lord. Hashem, of course, the Lord. And you notice the verse that he puts in there. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt, I've showed you wonders. Do you notice where, where this physicist has taken us? Right here. What he's not fully aware of, I don't think, is we're almost here. Okay? All right, let's pull out another sheet here. So much to do. and It's amazing what's going on, Tom. I'm telling you, and... Uh, you know, one of the things that I just pray for the Christian church, we get as excited about life as people who win the lottery, you know? You, know, you go up to people, oh, you won the Powerball, you got $80 million, woo! You know, they're running around. People used to get excited in a game show winning a washing machine. The Christian church, we ought to have some excitement and interest in what's going on. Because everything that's going on is for you and myself 
and God's purposes. He knows our name. He knows what I'm teaching tonight. He knows where this is going. He knows when the trumpet is going to sound. All of this is coming on, and I'm just feeling like, what did I do, answers nothing, to be teaching in this hour? Nothing. It's nothing special about me. But God chose me, and he chose you. And we are a part of these great promises. Okay, let's take a look here at this one here. It's a, it's a concordance. You have, it's like a three-page concordance. You want to pull that out? We're going to have a little Bible study here, and then we're going to spend some time in Revelation chapter 12 and Ezekiel chapter 38, and I'm going to show you what's about to happen. And how certain am I of that? 100%. So that's always a good percentage, you know, when you have a high percentage like that, you know. It's like, it's like if you go up to a Christian and say, do you really believe the Bible is totally true? And you go, well, yeah, largely. You know, what's killing the church, everybody, is we've got a lot of the Lord's people. We are a lot of 90 percenters in the church. It's largely true, but, you know, it's, we're living in a modern age. Things change, you know. Skirt lengths have changed. You know, hair, you know. And so in the end, our kids are living in a 90 percent church. Let's get them into a 100 percent church. The Lord loves you, and he's got a plan. He's never going to lie to you. He's going to take care of you. The kids in Australia, he's going he's to do great things. Let's, let's look to that. Okay, now, what I want you to do on this sheet now is I've given you, I asked my computer to give me all verses in the Bible that say this phrase. All right, and this, this is a great phrase, so let me put it up here now. Because... What was the thing that the people of Israel realized when they saw Pharaoh's army and all the crazy stuff happened to the, to the Egyptians? What did everybody do? He's God. He's God. Everybody looked at this and go, whoa. Whatever this is, it's the Lord, you know. And so what we actually have here is Exodus chapter 15. Let's turn there real briefly and then I'll get into this sheet. Now here I am, a Gentile believer, right? The Jewish people, they don't know much about their own Exodus story. You know, a lot of the Jewish people, the kids, maybe a lot of the kids even in, in Mariah College in uh, Australia, I, I don't know. I don't know what the kids know about their own history, you know. They did. And by the way, I thought their Hebrew was great. And so they're already bilingual. They're ready for the millennium. Right? They're all set, Tom. They're ready to roll. All right. Exodus chapter 15. The rabbis used to all teach this. They all taught the same thing. The last Exodus will be as the first. All the rabbis in history since the Exodus that wrote on these things said, the very last Exodus story will be similar as the first one. So whatever we've already seen, it's coming back. It's here. It's really here right now. All right. Exodus chapter 15. And by the way, did you know that Exodus 15 is the first public worship service in the Bible? Yeah, it's the first public worship service in the Bible. So let me write. So what, what caused the worship? They saw what the Lord did to deliver them. What did Jesus do for us? Kept us out of hell. Forgave sin. Loved us. You see, when we see God's done something for us, what does that always produce? Worship. Right now, Israel's not worshiping our Lord, but they will. It's almost here now. The physicist is getting started tonight. He's already beginning. These are miracles that we're watching. And so we see in Exodus 15, this is the first public worship service. So what causes people to worship? To see great things that God has done. When you see an entire army wiped out, when you see the entire armies of Iran, Russia, right, Turkey, and other nations vaporized, 
They're all trying to kill Israel now, of course. That gets your attention. And you begin to say, our God has delivered us from our enemies. You know, the problem we're having in our culture today is we don't think there's a thing called evil. I mean, I think we're really struggling with that here in America. I mean, I think a lot of these people that are supporting Hamas, well, we're just folks and let's just love everybody. No, saints, we're watching some really dark things underway. And what we need today is moral clarity from the Christian church and some of our leaders to say, you know what? That is wrong. That is evil. And that's what we need today, I think, more than anything. So let's look at Exodus chapter 14. Uh, let's take a look here. Then the Lord said to Moses, this is chapter 14, verse 26, stretch out your hand over the sea so the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. At the daybreak, the sea went back to the place, right? The Egyptians were fleeing toward it and swept um, into the sea. Now, why is this such an important day? This is the day Jesus rose from the dead. So we understand that the chronology of the Exodus is the same chronology that we have here. See, when God's enemies are defeated, we celebrate. So our Lord's resurrection is connected to the story of the Exodus, right? Okay. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. You know, I really get it. I mean, it's hard to watch this, you know. What about the civilian casualties? Wasn't the Lord a little rough here on Pharaoh's army? Do you see what's happened to us? We've heard a lot about civilian casualties, and I don't want anyone to die. But this idea that you can do the things that are going on and there isn't going to be any penalty for that? I mean, this is where we are, church, because a lot of people in our country, they have this idea that we, and, and we're the same nation, by the way, that dropped two atomic bombs on, on Japanese cities. 150,000 people were killed in four seconds. Now we're telling Israel, oh, you have to watch out for civilian casualties, but Israel's been very careful, I think very concerned about that. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and the Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when, the, and when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Now you notice that all of a sudden, what happens? They have a worship service. Verse 1, then Moses and the Israelites, what? They began singing. There's a, a worship service that's happening now. They sang this song to the Lord. And he's quoted in Psalm 78, by the way. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord has become my strength and my salvation. He has become my song. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them, they sank to the depths like a stone. And so this whole chapter is talking about the judgment on people trying to destroy Israel. We're in the same place. Nothing has changed. I mean, you know, the, the nations that are out after her now, including this, this whole group over there in Iran, it's crazyville. There's no difference there between them and between us. So that's chapter 15. All right, let's take out this sheet now that I gave you. You ready to have a little fun here? I hope so. And I asked, my, I asked my computer again to put this phrase in. These are very handy things, by the way. One of your best tools is just know the words in the Bible, and you can find these things online for free. I asked the, my computer to say, then you will know that that I am the Lord. All right. And then he goes on and says, who brought you out? So this phrase is, why is the Lord saying this? He says, when you see what I'm doing, you're going to know that I'm the Lord. Now, what's the problem in Israel right now? They don't know who the Lord is. 
when they see him go to work in the near future, there ain't going to be any doubts about it. An entire army vaporized. And this is not with any Israeli military defense. See, this guy here who says he's amazed that 99%, I mean, people could say, well, you know, they had the military, they're just good, you know. But when this is coming up, what's about to happen, nobody can take any credit for it because it will be 100% the Lord. And the moment they know that and they see that, the nation will be converted. Then they'll know that I'm the Lord. Now, you notice on the sheet I gave you here tonight, we have the first mention of that phrase in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. Okay, that's the first place that that's mentioned. In other words, God's telling them, I'm about to deliver you from the Egyptians. You're going to see this amazing thing, and then you'll know I'm the Lord. Okay, so we have others of this here in Exodus 7, 5, Exodus 7, 17, 10, 2, Exodus 14, 4. But then, and you notice, you notice, so there are two books that we see here that are mainly the big uses of this phrase. Then you will know that I'm the Lord. Then you will know that I'm the Lord. The first one is the book of Exodus, and the second one is the book of Ezekiel. Now, why is the book of Ezekiel have this phrase more than any other book in the Bible? Because the book of Ezekiel is about the restoration of Israel. You see, Exodus is getting them out of Egypt, but then they sin and they go into captivity. We probably know a little bit about that. Ezekiel is the greatest usage of this phrase because it's about restoration of the land of Israel. Now, what are some of the things that the Lord did to restore Israel? He brought them out of the nations. He brought the Jews out of Europe. He brought them out of the United States. He brought them out of Russia. He's been bringing them out. And you will read if we had time to go through it tonight. But here's the ones you want to look at. Because we got, we got the great miracle coming up here, um, here. Take a look on page three. And we could spend all evening with this. And I'm just giving you a... Let's take a look here. Verse 20, um, 38. Ezekiel 38, 23. Everybody find that? It's on the third page. And so I will show my greatness and my holiness, and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. How much of that has happened to date? Nothing. Which is telling us what? God is getting ready to do something. And when he does it, the world is going to say, you know, that's the God of Israel. And that's going to be the dramatic thing. And we're going to see this. We're going to start watching stuff, and I don't know how much of it we'll see before the Lord returns. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I had a little cold here tonight, so please forgive me. I thought about staying home. <laughs> I said to my wife, I said, you know, I'd like to stay home and, and just have soup. But I want to share this with the people. Well, I don't know. I mean, hopefully it's, it's, anyway. Okay, so now what's going to happen? Because Ezekiel 38 and 20, 23 is the beginning of the Third World War. You know, you hear this all the time, right? I've mentioned this many times. How many times have you heard that recently? And as I've shared in class for, for many years now, what are all world wars about? World War I, World War II, World War III, it's about Israel. Bring Jerusalem back, bring the nation back, bring the Lord back. That's what's underway now. And what do we hear about any of these wars with regards to Israel? Zero. Okay, let's take a look at Ezekiel. Uh, 38.23, and now let's look at 39.6. What's God going to do to this group that's after Israel now? I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in safety in the coastlands. By the way, where are we living right now? We're living on the coastlands. Where's our major population centers? New York and California. 
The coastlands are a name for the Gentile nations. So what we find out here, we'll put this together for you in a minute. And what do they all think is going to happen when all this drama starts to unfold? Peace and safety, peace and security. So what we actually have here in this passage is we have peace and security with the Antichrist. And so, as everybody's feeling nice and peacey and safety in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, what's going to happen? A world war is going to start. Fire is going to hit these places. You know, it's kind of interesting when you look at at the numbers, and I don't want to be gloomy here, but if you look at the numbers in the book of Revelation, they're pretty heavy duty. We're not talking about a couple thousand people. We're talking millions of people are going to be killed. I'm not having any fun telling you that. The Bible tells you that. I mean, a third of the earth burned up. I mean, what in the world are we talking about here? So anyway, this is the problem. We just aren't aware that God is serious here. And then here's the verse that I want to spend some time on. Look at Ezekiel 39, 22. Everybody find that verse? And I underlined it. From that day forward, the people of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God. They're going to know. And that is the beginning of the national conversion. Now, where is that national conversion? Revelation 12. Let's turn to that now and spend some time on that with maybe the time remaining. One of the things that I've learned over many years as a pastor, if you have the ability to use a concordance and just look at words, it's very critical to be able to study the Bible. All right, let's go to, X, I'm sorry, uh, Revelation chapter 12. And then we will come back and pick up some stuff if we have time in Ezekiel 38 and 9, which is where we're heading to very fast right now. We're going to get a little break here with the Antichrist coming in, but uh, he's, he's coming. And we really can't have what's coming without the Antichrist coming. I mean, that's just really a central part of the Bible. Whether we understand it or like it, the Bible is very clear that the world did not want the Lord and they're accepting a counterfeit. And we see that today. You know, how many people today really believe and understand that when you vote and support certain kinds of people, that you don't want God? How many people realize that? Some of the candidates that people are voting for, I'm going, huh? The message that you or people are sending, you don't want God. I don't know about you, that does not end up well. And the problem is our pastors need to be challenging the congregations with some of these truths. Because we have people, I think, I I think the Christian church has really been a part of this problem as I've shared over the years. All right, Revelation chapter 12. Now I'm going to put this, let's see here. All right, let me erase this, and then I want to... So let's go to Revelation 12, and let me show you what God is doing. Let me put a little quick timeline for you to kind of, kind of dial you in, because what's God going to do in Revelation chapter 12? He's going to replay the story of the Exodus, right? That's what we said over here. He's going to replay the Exodus. So here comes the Antichrist. Everybody's singing, singing happy land, right? Antichrist, peace and safety. And what nobody realizes, and sadly the Jewish people don't realize, they just welcome the new Pharaoh. So you have the new Pharaoh. Now, if you have a Pharaoh, what does it tell you must happen? You've got to have an exodus, right? That's really what Revelation 12 is about. So watch this, everybody. We've got peace and safety here. And in the third year, we're going to have the battle of Gog and Magog, which we'll hopefully touch on tonight in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Now, when that battle happens, God is going to vaporize the army. You think this thing the other week when he stopped these uh, drones or whatever coming in? That's nothing. They're just going to be gone. I mean, this is heavy-duty stuff, right? So, after that period, Israel begins to know what? 
then they'll know that I'm the Lord. Now, if you, you know, would you agree that if that happened, you'd know something was underway? And you see how, look how the Lord's even get attention of the physicist, right? He's just watching this thing statistically. But you see a couple million people vaporized, that's going to get your attention. So all of a sudden, what happens right after that? Because this is going to happen on Yom Kippur. What happened to Israel in 1973? She fell asleep thinking she was peaceful and secure because that was the highest holy day of the year, 1973. That's when they had their greatest casualties in the Yom Kippur War because what happened is the armies went after her on Yom Kippur. That's the highest, holiest day of the year, right? And so what happens in the Bible? Things repeat. So after this thing happens on Yom Kippur, now all of a sudden the Antichrist says, hey, it's time to take control of the nation here. I, you know, look, look, I got to get... So now we have the temple desecrated. And so all of a sudden, what happens when the temple's desecrated? I am your God. And of course, our Lord spoke about this in Matthew 24. And what did our Lord say? He says, you got to get out of town. Don't hang around with that guy. So what do they do? They go into the wilderness. How long do they go in the wilderness? Three and a half years. Second coming. This, people of God, that's Revelation chapter 12. Now you'll notice at the beginning of the chapter, which we'll read now, is that this demonic power begins to grow and this hatred toward Israel grows. You'll see it here in the early verses. Now, What's, what's the problem that we have when we're voting for people? We think they're, they're lambs. We think they're sheep. They're wolves. That's what's happened. We've elected a lot of wolves into office, right? When the Antichrist comes in, he's kissing babies. He's making peace. He's loving everything. Now, as this thing unfolds, all of a sudden, God has acted dramatically to save the nation and he claims the, the, the glory for it and says he's God. But they know he isn't. They know he's just a human being. He's just a person like us, right? So he tries to steal the glory from the Lord. That's really what people are doing. By all politicians, by the way, who are not servants and want us to serve them, they're stealing the glory because God gave them the position and the power to serve. Right? They're stealing from him. That's what's going on. All right, let's take a look at the chapter here. So I hope you can see where we are in the thing. And now look at this verse. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars. So there's Israel. She was pregnant and cried out in pain and was about to give birth. So she's three and a half years from giving birth to the reborn nation. Then, verse 3, another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns. This is the Antichrist kingdom. His tail swept down a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. And how, how in the Bible was our Lord almost devoured when he was born? King Herod, remember Herod went ahead and was trying to kill all the children. That's a fulfillment in prophecy here in Revelation 12. So he says, she gave birth to a son, a male child who will rule the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days, which we all know you know, we should have shirts printed up in this class. Three and a half years, you know. When people come up to you, admire, what, what is that three and a half years? So anyway, we know, do you see what we've got right now? Here we are, saints, right over here. We're in 2024. We know that this war is coming with Iran. What's going to follow the war? This. When the Iran war and all of that's underway now and all that's going to happen here, 
we're going to, this, so I'll call this one. So here's the way it rolls. You got war building, we all see that. Then we go to this position, right? Then after, of course, we have the false peace, then we have real war where they're trying to destroy Israel and God just says, you're not gonna do it and vaporizes them all. Doesn't need the IDF, he doesn't need a helicopter, they're gone. So then we have, so this is the false peace. And then here's the real war. Real wars always follow false pieces. And then after the real war, we get the true peace. This number four. So you see, what, what the world cannot see, they cannot see what's coming. What the world sees is we got this mess in the Middle East. And thank goodness we have the United Nations. Because with them, all things are possible. And remember this church, that what was the purpose of the United Nations? To work to guarantee peace and security in the world in 1947 by creating a two-state solution for Israel and the Palestinians. That was one of the charter purposes of the United Nations in 1947. How's that working out? And the Biden administration, as we shared in class, what do they want to do now after this terrible thing with Hamas? He wants to, they want to give the Palestinian people the two-state solution as a reward or a way in their minds to slow the train down. But the reality is 70, 80% of all the Palestinians, they support Hamas. You see, the whole thing is just a, a, a demonic counterfeit. So here we are, 2024. Now, to get from here to here, this is where we probably all wonder, how much longer do we have? And I don't know, but I'm telling you, just get on the line, find your line, and just stay with the line. When you see something in the news, oh, okay. See, it'd be fun for me to watch some of you, you know, a certain thing will happen, and then I'll wonder, is the class thinking about that? Do they realize the significance of what's underway? You know, I don't know, and I hope you are, because you've got to help other people. So you watch this, church. This is where we are. Get on the line. Find out where that baby's going. Keep your eyes on it. I'll try to tell you what I see. But anyway, one leads to two, leads to three, leads to four. And, of course, just as the false peace comes in, we will be with the Prince of Peace. We will be with the Lord Jesus Christ. So the rapture takes place right here. And um, it's exciting days coming up here. That is premillennialism. Because i got to tell you over here, when World War III breaks into, how many of you think that's going to end well? I don't see anybody can look at the state of the world and the weapons that we have and think that that's going to end okay. And the church is going to run around and conquer and be post-millennial and win everybody to Christ and have peace everywhere. I don't see it. And if I miss something, you know, please let me know, right? Okay, so let's go back to the text. So what is Revelation chapter 12? You could put it in your notes. It's a Passover story. It's the last Passover where the Antichrist comes after them, and then what do they do? They flee out of Israel and go into the wilderness exactly the way they did in the story of Moses and the Exodus, which we know was 3,400 years earlier. So when you think about the time here, just put a figure up here for the date. 1400 B.C. I just pick a rough date. Here we are at 2024. So 3400 years ago, the very plan that you're seeing befolding before our eyes already was on the table. So it's not like the Lord just kind of said, you know, I'll try something new. No, he loves his people. He has one plan to deliver them from their enemies. He hates Pharaoh and people trying to take us into bondage. And so in the end, of course, we know that the Antichrist is the Pharaoh. And so basically what the story is over here, what's the story with Pharaoh? Let my people go. And by the way, the Antichrist goes after them. We can look at that in Daniel chapter 11. The Antichrist goes after Israel, but he can't get her. She's being held and protected in the wilderness by the Lord. We'll try to pick some of this up here a little later. Let's go back to the text. 
And there was war, verse 7, in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He is hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now the power, I'm sorry, now have come the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, for the accuser of his brothers, who accuses them night and day, has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you on earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury now because he knows his time is short. How short? Three and a half years. Right. By the way, it was kind of interesting, you know, one of the things you saw this pattern during the Second World War, if you follow some of the history of Germany, that near the end, Hitler knew the war was already over. He knew that the generals told him, you're not, you can't win, the Russians are coming, the Americans have landed, you know, whatever. Do you know what he did? He spent a lot of time working with some of his leadership to kill as many of the Jews as he could because he knew his time was short. He'd reroute, they, they, they would reroute trains that were used for munitions and soldiers and they would load Jews on them and send to Auschwitz. He knew it was only a matter of time. They'd lost the war. But he was filled with this rage, this demonic rage to kill as many of the Jews as he could. And you see this is the same thing now. And that's why when you listen to some of the people that we see, we're not talking to rational people. This is not like sitting around and just having a nice little chat. There's a rage here that you can see. It's, I think it's palpable. I think it's incredible. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of an eagle so that she might fly to a place prepared for her in the desert. Sound familiar? This is Exodus chapter 19, by the way, replaying itself. Exodus 19, 4 where she would be taken care of for time, times, and half a time, which we know is three and a half years. And notice, out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river at the dragon it spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, and those who obey God's commandments and holds to the testimony of Jesus. Some just incredible things, church, are being talked about there. Let me leave you with one thought tonight as we go. And then next week, I keep trying to get to the economic thing. But remember, church, this is a big transition right now. Okay, We're here. We're heading here. Year, two, whatever it's going to be. But we're also going to have major issues coming up with the economy. And, and I think that's a major thing that is going to happen in the next year to two years. We're going to see major, major, major things going on in our economic system. And then, remember we talked before, that right after the conclusion of World War II, remember what happened? Remember the year 1944 we talked about? When the war was coming to an end in Europe, what did they all do? They all came to Bretton Woods, New Hampshire in 1944, and they had the Bretton Woods Agreement, which came up with a global currency, which happened to be the U.S. dollar. And so in 1945, they crafted a world economic system using the U.S. dollar and connecting it to gold. And what do we know about gold? It's the all-time high because the dollar is falling apart. So here's my point. When the world is in trouble after this giant war that's coming, What's it going to do? It's time for a reset. We got to have a reset. We got to get everybody working together. We got to have kumbaya. We got to have peace and security. We got to have an economic system that considers everything. And I think this is the great setup for central bank digital currency. Now, exactly how and when all this is coming, we don't know. But I can tell you that these things are already being discussed. They're already talking about it. Let me leave you with one last thought. And we'll get you out the door here. All right, let me erase this. Because everybody always wants to know, you know, 
exactly when and, you know, and if I told you exactly I knew when, I would probably not be a good teacher, right? But I can give you some general things. Here's what we want to know about what the Lord tells us. And I've, sh I've shared this before, but let me give you this as we leave tonight. The best way to think about what's about to happen is to realize it's all patterned after Jesus. That makes sense, doesn't it? What is Jesus' great story? His great story is the resurrection. All right, everybody's with me on that. I'm just putting some rough dates up there. So our Lord's resurrection is 30 AD. Okay, now there was a generation that saw that. The apostles, many people, I'm preaching on that Sunday. But anyway, so this generation goes all the way over here to what? The book of Revelation is written. So we come up here to 95 AD, and we have the book of Revelation. So you notice that from the time of the resurrection until we had the book of Revelation, the Bible essentially closed, we got about 65, let's say 65 to 70 years. Okay, this is what we have. We'd have a view of one generation. Now, again, I'm just giving you some rough ideas. Now, if this is the template that God is using, and I believe it is, what should we as Christians be doing? Look for the next important resurrection. 1948. Now, if you roll ahead 70 years, that moves us over here roughly to 2000. What? If you had 70 years to this, you come up with 2018. All right, which is always fascinating to me. Who was the president in 2018? Trump was the president, right? And what's the one thing that he did that nobody seemed to understand? He made Jerusalem the undivided capital of Jerusalem, of Israel. I think one of the things we have to realize is God's going to get it done. It's not picking politicians, it's getting his will done. And if he wants Jerusalem exalted, lifted up, it's not about politics, Democrats, Republicans. He has a purpose to honor his plans for Israel. So we come over here to 2018. Here we are, 2024. But Psalm 90 says that a generation is approximately, well, let's take a look at it. We're, we're almost there, church. I mean, I'm telling you, we're almost there. So let's take a look at Psalm 90, and we'll wrap it up tonight with this, this Psalm 90. Now, take a look at this one. I'll just throw, I'm just, now again, please understand, it's only general. I'm just giving you some general things. But our Lord said in Matthew 24, one generation, right? We know one generation took us to the end toward John's life. We got one generation here. We know that one generation, according to the Bible, is somewhere around 70 years. Okay? Somewhere in that ballpark, right? Verse 10, I'm starting to experience this, by the way. This is starting to creep in here. It says, the length of our days is 70 years, or 80 if we have strength, and their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass, and we fly away. All right, so let's take a look at what's happened in Israel. Israel's been around for 70 years. Okay, somewhat after that first thing, that was the thing to keep an eye on, Israel's resurrection, 2018. And then in the last couple of years, all hell breaking loose. Because she's reached her 70, but now it's in times of trouble because you get to be over in your 70s. I hate to say this, we're noticing aches and pains. But notice how the psalmist ends. That when we're in the midst of our trials and the pain and it gets worse, woo, we're gone. We fly away, right? So I think it's kind of interesting that we go all the way out. So if we move out to 80 years, where's 80 years take us here? 80 years takes us to 2028. And then what's the Bible say? Well, you get to be certain age after trouble, you fly away. Now, I am not forcing Psalm 90 into this thing, but what I am saying is we are moving into every intersecting line in the Bible. Now, whether it's one year, two years, three years... We're near. And the church needs to see that. Our Lord never said to predict the day, but he said the season we should know something about. And anybody who's watching this war in Iran and think that has nothing to do with the Bible, we're not reading the same Bible. 
So go out there and help somebody find these things and understand the great love of the Lord for them. And let's have a great time, right? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. You have a great evening, everybody.